When the Buddha defined his sermon, he defined it as knowledge of arising and passing away, noble, penetrative, leading to the right ending of stress. And some people hearing that focus on the arising and passing away. and say that discernment is all about seeing the principle of inconstancy. Things come and they go. Nothing's permanent. But the adjectives that the Buddha used to describe that knowledge show there's more than that. One thing he says is penetrative. And elsewhere he defines penetrative as seeing the gradations of things, distinctions of things, things that are skillful, things that are unskillful what kind of results they lead to. So it's more than just arising and passing away. You see what kind of arisings are skillful and which ones are not, and which things lead to well-being and which ones don't. That has to do with the noble part. Because remember when the Buddha defined the noble search as the search for what is deathless. So what kind of knowledge about arising and passing away would lead to the deathless, to the right ending of stress? The Buddha goes on to define discernment in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Here's where he lays it out, what's skillful and what's not. Craving is an unskillful cause. Because it leads to clinging, which is suffering. The Noble Eightfold Path is a pattern of action that leads to the end of suffering. So there's a the distinction right there. And discernment is all about distinctions. There's another place where the Buddha defines discernment as seeing things as separate. You don't just glom things together. You don't deal in vague generalities. You look at specifically what's happening. And more specifically, what's happening in your mind. Because when you talk about the principles of causality, this is where the Buddha is really focused. He's not concerned about the causality out there in the world so much, except when he uses it to illustrate points having to do with causality in the mind. But the causality here, of course, is intention, which is based on contact, and also Colors contact. But the intention is the important thing, because that's going to lead to the results. And John Munn made this point one time in one of his talks that was written down, or the notes were taken. He talked about how when Sariputta was still a wanderer, he met Venerable Asaji. You probably know the story. Asaji was on his alms round. And Sariputta was impressed just by his demeanor. This is something good for monks to think about. What's your demeanor during an alms run? Is this kind of thing that would impress somebody that would make them want to ask a question, who is your teacher, what does he teach? But he realized that while Asaji was on his alms run, it was the wrong time to ask, so he followed him out of the town. And when Asaji had sat down for his meal, then he came in and asked him, and Asaji said, I'm new in this dharma. I, don't, I can't explain very much. I can just explain the jest. And Sariputta said, that's what I want. I want just the jest. Asaji started out, whatever arises from a cause, its cause and its cessation. That's the teaching of the great contemplative. And Ajahn Mun noted that when Sariputta heard the word cause, he wasn't looking at causes outside, he immediately looked at causes in the mind. That, John Munn said, was the, the big cause. And how are you going to bring about the cessation of things that arise from a cause? Well, you have to turn around and look at the cause itself and see what's making it give rise to these things and how it can stop. And Sariputta is Wisdom, his discernment was so sharp, that's immediately how he interpreted it. And he immediately looked into what was beyond at the, after the cessation of that cause. That's how he saw the deathless. 
That's the kind of insight, that's the kind of discernment that's noble. When you look at the Four Noble Truths, you notice, of course, that discernment itself plays a role in right view and right resolve. And when the Buddha lays out the Eightfold Path, he puts right view and right resolve first. Discernment comes first, then virtue, then concentration. In some of his other explanations, saying the five faculties and the five strengths, it's virtue, concentration, discernment. In the Seven Factors of Awakening, the factors themselves don't contain virtue, but there's a passage where the Buddha says they build on virtue, so that in that case you've got virtue, then discernment, then concentration. So the order is not fixed. Similarly, that virtue is, of those three trainings, virtue is the first one to be mastered, then concentration is mastered, then discernment is mastered. But that doesn't mean you just do virtue or do concentration without any discernment. The discernment has to be there to inform it all the way along. Because you're looking at what are your actions? What are you doing right now? Or now you say, I'm watching my breath. Why are you watching the breath? Get the mind into concentration. Why would you want to get the mind into concentration? Because the mind in concentration can see things more clearly. What do you want to see things clearly for? So I can stop causing suffering. See how I'm causing suffering now, and I can learn how to stop. So in doing concentration, the motivation is discerning. The same with the precepts. You follow the precepts, not just to be obedient to the rules, because you realize it's an important part of training the mind. For the sake of concentration, for the sake of the discernment, and on to release. Which means that we have to bring discernment to all aspects of our practice. When you're observing the precepts, they're sometimes challenging. You know some information that you don't want to divulge, and someone asks you for it, and you're afraid that that person's going to misuse it. So how do you not give it? In some cases you just simply don't give it, in other cases you have to distract the person. There are ants in your house. How do you get them out without killing them? The precepts present challenges, and it's in meeting with the challenges that you develop your discernment. Of course, your, motiv your original motivation for observing the precepts starts out with discernment, but in the practice you develop more. This is in line with the Buddha's observation. There are three sources for discernment. There's listening, which includes reading. There's thinking things through. And then there's developing. In other words, you develop good qualities in the mind. Of the three, of course, the last one is the really important one. But it's informed by the other two. We think of the forest tradition as being sort of rough and ready and non-scholarly, and it is very much anti-scholarly in a lot of ways. But it doesn't mean that the forest Johns were not well read in the Dharma and the Vinaya. They knew their Dhamma really well. They knew their Vinaya really well. It's just that they realize that after having read these truths and having thought about them, the truths compel you to try to develop them in your mind. That's a sign that they knew how to read. So as we practice discernment through with virtue, we're taking our original insight that virtue is going to be a good thing, and it gets developed and refined. The same with concentration. We start out with the general idea that concentration is going to be good. And then we have to wrestle the mind down. This is what directed thought and evaluation are all about. And as John Lee points out, directed thought and evaluation are the work of discernment. Trying to figure out if the mind's not settling down, why? Is the problem with the breath or is the problem with the mind? If the problem is the breath, well, Work with it. Breathe in different ways. Long, short, medium, deep or shallow, heavy, light, fast, slow, 
narrow, broad. Think of the breath coming in, going down the body. Think of the breath coming in, coming from the bottom, so the soles of your feet up through the legs. See what that does. You can work with the breath. You can imagine the breath in lots of different ways, and it will have an impact on how the breath energy flows in the body. You find that the energy is really responsive to images in the mind. Then when you found something good, how do you maintain it? That's the next work for directed thought and evaluation. And then when you maintain it, how do you spread it? So a sense of ease fills the body. You're bathed in a sense of fullness. So concentration starts with discernment and it refines your discernment. And John Lee, when he wrote one of his first Dharma books, pointed this out as one of the distinctive features of what he had learned from a John Munn. We don't just do virtue and then concentration, then discernment. He says your discernment has to foster your virtue and concentration. Your concentration has to foster your virtue and discernment. And of course your virtue fosters concentration and discernment. They help one another along. But the important thing here is that discernment is strategic. It's not something you read about or think about and leave it there. You try to develop the good qualities in the mind that discernment says will be good to develop. And you figure out all the twists and turns of the mind as it resists that. As the Buddha once said, one of the measures of your discernment is knowing that something is going to be good for you, but you don't like to do it. But you can still talk yourself into doing it, or knowing something that's not going to be good for you, but you like doing it. This is where a lot of addictions come in. But you can talk yourself into wanting not to do it. The sermon is strategic, it's pragmatic. It's there to guide your actions. So we're not here just watching things arising and passing away and thinking that that in and of itself is wise. We're trying to figure out what kind of things can we give rise to in the mind that would be good. Because that's when your knowledge of arising and passing away is really useful, is when you understand the causes for what can make good things arise. And what can make bad things pass away? That's what discernment is good for. Always keep that pragmatic side in, in mind. When the, the Buddha lays out the three qualities that you bring to mindfulness practice, which is, is the basis for concentration, he lists mindfulness. Alertness, ardency. And as John Lee points out, the ardency is the discernment there. In other words, seeing that the purpose of all this is to put it into practice and to do it well. So listen to the Dharma, think about the Dharma. But if you really want to know the Dharma, you've got to commit yourself to doing it. Reflect on what you're doing so you can do it better and better. That's what it means to be wise. <laughs>